We're so glad that you've gathered to worship the Lord with us. And uh, I'm pretty fired up right now to invite you to open your Bibles, please, uh, to John chapter 8. To John chapter 8, I said uh, to someone as we were preparing for the service today, uh, John chapter 8 is really a passage of Scripture that you just absolutely would never preach through, ever, if you weren't committed to preaching through everything uh, that's in the Bible. Uh, It's actually a uh, um, a 59-verse argument uh, between Jesus Christ uh, and the Pharisees. Uh, He's pretty calm, pretty direct, and they're pretty out of control. And back and forth and back and forth and back and forth it goes. But as I studied it, I really actually got a a, a ton out of it. And I'd like to begin uh, with this uh, thought today. I think, uh, hopefully you'll agree about this. Uh, Answer the big questions uh, and the little questions uh, will take care of themselves. Do you agree with that? If you answer the big questions uh, in life, uh, the little questions will take care of themselves. Uh, Think uh, with me about that just for a second. Think about various uh, spheres in your life. Uh, Take, for example, uh, in the government where the uh, squabbling uh, seems to be uh, absolutely a nonstop. Would you agree? And and I'm not saying any of these things are little questions uh, in the sense of, you know, what happened in Benghazi exactly? And what are we going to do about Medicare? and And what about the budget? And back and forth and back and forth and never stops. A lot of little questions. How about, how about this big question? Can a nation that forsakes God and His Word for multiple generations expect to escape His judgment? See, get the big question on the table. Let's get, be done with the little questions and let's get a big, big question uh, on the table. If you take care of the big questions, the little questions take care of themselves. This is true in uh, families. If you've ever been in a family squabble or tried to referee one, you know, you, you, you so many families are trapped in minutia. You spend too much on the groceries. Yeah, well, you don't, you don't respect me. And, and, and when, when are you going to start this? And, and, and I thought I told you. And, and uh, how about this? Are we as a family uh, living under the authority of God's word? Or, or uh, practically, Are we as a family living within our means financially? A lot of little questions would fall off the table in a hurry if you'd get the right answers to the big questions. This is certainly true in church. What do you mean we're not going to have bulletins anymore? And, 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 And by the way, now that I have your attention, when are we going to start singing more hymns? How about this? Are the elders leading our church in harmony? And are they in submission together to the leading of the Holy Spirit for our church? See, you can can get so, I got a great answer to that one too, by the way, praise God. And it's just, you can get so trapped in little questions. And what I'm trying to suggest, and I think if, if you get this thought, it's gonna really take us through this passage in an awesome way. If you take care of the big questions, the little questions will take care of themselves. And we got the biggest question in the universe on the table today. I'll tell you straight up. I don't know how you got to church this weekend. Maybe you come here every week. Maybe somebody dragged you in here. I'm just glad you're here however you got here. This is the question that will matter to you more than anything else. A hundred years, a thousand years, 10,000 years from today. Here it is. Here's the big question. Take care of this, everything else will take care of itself. Get this wrong, nothing will be right. But get this right, and everything's right, no matter what's wrong. Here it is. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? That's the big question right there. Amen. like those answers. I got some for you, too. Right from the Bible. Here they come, all right? Let's take a second and pray first. Father, thank you for... Uh, the enthusiasm of these learners. And uh, thank you, Father, that we don't have to uh, search about, we don't have to speculate, we don't have to root through dusty books. We have the living and abiding Word of God. And so we turn our attention to it now. We thank you for the way that Jesus Christ is revealed in the Gospel of John, and we are delighting in our pursuit of authentic Jesus. 
We pray in this message that great clarity would come to every heart. Be with the one who, who has known you and loved you and followed you maybe for decades, but even as they listen, cause them to pray and remember the time when they did not know. And I pray that everyone could know who uh, is Jesus Christ. Take care of that question in all of our lives uh, during this uh, study of your word. I pray, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to try to go through this. Uh, we studied for a couple of weeks, uh, Drop the Rock, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Um, I'm now at uh, verse 12. Um, here's the first thing. Who is Jesus Christ? Uh, he's the light of the world. That's who he is. He's the light uh, of the world. Notice in verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's going to say that again. Just look across your page at chapter 9, verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Now, uh, if you don't know uh, who Jesus Christ is, that, that seems like a pretty outrageous claim, right? Like you don't hear a lot of, you won't hear that at work this week. Nobody in the office will be like, I'm the light of the world, okay? And, and uh, it's, it's, it's really kind of hard to make sense of until you, I like what John MacArthur said about this in his commentary. He said, Jesus Christ alone brings the light of salvation to a sin-darkened world. To the darkness of falsehood, he is the light of truth. To the darkness of ignorance, he is the light of wisdom. To the darkness of sin, he is the light of holiness. To the darkness of sorrow, he is the light of joy. And to the darkness of death, he is the light of life. Now, Jesus Christ is the light. Now, um, let me just add, we like honesty in church. How, how many people have uh, done something uh, in their life um, that they're, you know, you'd prefer for others really not to have to know. It would bother you if it was about to come up on the screen. I think a good word is ashamed. How many of you have done something they're ashamed of? Now, I'm not talking about I broke the speed limit, I, I had an extra cookie. I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about ashamed, ashamed. Go ahead, put your hand up. It's all right. Put up your hand if you've done something that you're ashamed of. All right. Now, I just want you to imagine for a moment that, um, you're in that situation where you're doing that thing that you most regret about your whole life. It's pretty dark there. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden out of nowhere, around the corner comes Diane Sawyer with a, a film crew and the lights are on you, poof, everything's lit up and they, there's a microphone in your face saying, what exactly is going on here and why are you doing this? Now, that would be an awful, awful feeling. And if you understand that feeling of being exposed at your worst moment, then you understand what most people actually feel when they comprehend that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Months back we were studying in John chapter 3. Many people know John 3.16. John 3.19 says, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their e deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things, listen, hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. This is how many people experience Jesus Christ the one who exposes me, the one who, if you have someone in your family who's struggling, who's fallen, who's resisting, who's rebelling, who's refusing, and, and you, you puzzle in your heart, like, why is it they're so hard on me? Why is it that when I, I love them and, and then I come around them and they're like, they, they, I can just tell they just don't, they don't want me to be, do you, you understand now? That the light of Jesus Christ is shining forth from your life. This is why it's so important that we're constantly wrapped in his love. Because people feel exposed by the light. 
As long as you're loving sin, as long as you're rationalizing sin, as long as you're hiding and covering sin, the light of Jesus Christ exposes you. And you're like, man, man, get that camera out of my face. You've seen those things on TV, right? Where people are like, man, I don't want you filming me right now. And, and they cover themselves like this. And you've seen, how many people have seen all that? Right. Well, that's what Jesus Christ is to our souls. He's the light. But when you reach the bottom and you know that your life isn't working, and you're tired of trying to act like it is, and you bring your dark life to Jesus Christ who is light, who is forgiveness, who is hope, who is salvation. It's an awesome thing then when he gets you to the place. How many people can remember the time when you were done with the fighting and the hiding and the covering and you're like, just bring it, just put the light on me, just show it all. I want this, I wanna, I wanna change, I wanna be different, I wanna be clean, I wanna be saved. It's, a, it's an awesome, awesome thing that he does in our lives. First Peter chapter two, nine calls this the marvelous light. He says, into the marvelous light of the children of God. Jesus Christ is the light. He shows things for what they really are. And then this, who is Jesus Christ? He's the light of the world. And now for a few verses, he's the true witness. He's the true witness. Notice in verse 13, so the Pharisees, it's the religious leaders, the, honestly, the Bible thumpers, the angry, hyper, cranky Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Now the Mosaic law are required uh, that in a criminal case, Jesus hasn't broken any laws of any kind, but it did require the law that in a criminal case there had to be two witnesses. And, uh, but like I said, of course, Jesus hasn't been uh, charged with anything. Uh, the big question here is, is are his words uh, true? Are his words true? 30 times uh, in the Gospel of John, more than 30 times, we get various forms of this word uh, uh, true. Now again, Jesus Christ actually could have called uh, several witnesses. We've been studying the Gospel of John, so who could he have called uh, already here? Let me just look back in my Gospel of John here. I should be able to dig out some of these. He, he, chapter one, he could, have called, he could have called John the Baptist. I don't think he was, he wasn't, was he dead by this time? He could have called John, I don't think so. He could have called John the Baptist. He could have uh, called all the people that were at that wedding feast when he turned the water into wine. Uh, he could have called, uh, chapter three, who could he have called? He could have called Nicodemus for sure. Um, he could have also called uh, the woman at the well. Uh, he could have called the 5,000 people who were uh, fed in chapter six. He could have called that guy who was laying by the pool for 38 years. I mean, <laughs> Jesus already had a lot of witnesses he could have called, but he knew what they were really trying to get at. They were trying to say that his words weren't true. Verse 14, well, 13, so the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or uh, where I'm going. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I am the Father uh, who sent me. And Jesus is saying, in effect, I don't judge by appearance. I judge what my father tells me. We look at the heart. We're accurate. Verse 17, Jesus said, in your law it is written that the testimony of two men is true. He says, all right, you want to play this game? Two witnesses? Two witnesses? We can play that. You want to play two witnesses? You just think, who's he going to call? Nicodemus? So who's he going to call? Woman at the well? And for my star witness, um, the creator of the universe, <laughs> God the Father. I alone, it's not I alone who judge, but I am the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself and the Father who sent, you want a witness? You want a witness? 
God the Father uh, is my witness. He's the one uh, who witnesses uh, to me. I always like that part on the, uh, I guess I've been telling you a little bit lately that I, I do like those criminal shows, you know? Those 48 hour, who, who likes those shows besides me? Those are, those are, those are good. I like those a lot. And, and the best part is, is you, you, you never kind of can figure out, I'll say to Kathy, where's it going? What's going to happen? What's going to, and all of a sudden they'll bring out the star witness, you know, and the star witness will take the stand and say, I saw, or we conspired together, or, or uh, uh, here, here's the weapon, and, or something, and it's all over then. When the star witness steps up, now we know, we know, we know. Pretty awesome that Jesus says his star witness is God the Father. You know? I get it that people don't normally take the stand in their own defense. I get it that when you, I mean, I was thinking about this, that Scott Peterson guy, he never took the stand. O.J. Simpson never took the stand. That Casey um, Anthony. Anthony, she never took the stand. And I'm not saying those people are guilty or not. I don't have an opinion about it. But I know that in the court of public opinion, uh, people thought that they were guilty. But they never took the stand themselves. Why? Why? Because why don't you defend yourself? You don't defend yourself because your friends don't need you to and your enemies won't believe you, okay? And so um, uh, Jesus uh, didn't need uh, to take the stand. There he references God the Father. Now, of course, the point is, is that Jesus is God. And uh, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, we're trying to answer the question, uh, who is Jesus Christ? And I'm telling you, he is the true witness. Every word that comes out of his mouth, you can and should live by it. In fact, um, just give yourself a little test on this. Um, the, here, here's five words from the true witness. Now these are just uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, okay? So uh, this is just like kind of entry level Christianity. Give yourself a little test, score yourself on each of these, one through five. 25 would be a perfect score. I'd be surprised if anyone gets that. I certainly wouldn't, but score yourself. Five, I, I'm doing that, and zero, what's that? Okay, so here's the first one. Um, did you know that Jesus taught that heart and actions are the same? In Matthew five, Jesus said, if you lust, you're an adulterer. If you hate, you're a murderer. That's what came out of the mouth of the true witness. Jesus Christ said, your heart and your actions, it's the same thing. If you're thinking it and feeling it, from God's perspective, you're doing it. So before you assess yourself too easily, are you an adulterer? Are you a murderer? Here's a second thing that came out of the mouth of the true witness. And Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. In Matthew 6, he said, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. And then, we you got any illustrations? He said, okay, here's an illustration. You can't serve God and money. Either you're about God or you're about money, but you can't be about both. Uh, more teaching on that to follow. But I mean, absolutely, irrefutably too, true, only one God, not two masters. And then he said, we studied this last time, I dropped the rock. How's that, how'd that go this, time, this week? Hey, I heard that Ray Lewis got saved. <laughs> Praying for him, right? Right, how, how, the, how is this a good drop the rock week for you? Jesus said, you know, of course we have to assess and discern people's actions, but we don't judge their hearts. We don't know why they do what they do. Uh, this came out of the mouth of the true witness. And then he also said, um, in Matthew 7, 12, uh, he said, the way you want people to treat you, that's how you should treat people. So five would be, are you scoring yourself? Five would be, I'm killing that. I do that all the time. I only treat people the way I want to be treated, really? That's good. Well, no, actually, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm really easy on myself and really hard on everybody else around me. You get, you get zero on that, okay? But this is what came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. There's so much more, but this is just a little survey. And then the fifth thing he said, Matthew 7, he said, 
you know, I just can't tell if my sister's really uh, saved. I, Kathy and I have prayed for different members of our family. I remember praying for all of our kids when they were young that God would help us to see fruit in their life. Because at the end of the day, it's not what you say, it's, it's the fruit of, in your life that indicates by their fruits you will know them, Jesus said. So by the fruits of the Spirit, is there a growing pattern of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control? Is there a growing fruit of worship? Hebrews talks about offering unto God the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that give glory to his name. Romans talks about the fruit of sharing your faith and winning souls to Christ. So look at your life. What is the fruit of your life? What is coming along after the life that you're living? Do other people believe because you believe? Is there a growing pattern of Christ like? See, because from the mouth of the true witness, Jesus Christ, came a lot of things like those things. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the light of the world. He's the true witness. Everything that comes out of his mouth, everyone say, it's true. It's true. true. He's the true witness. If he says it, you don't need to think about it. You don't need to pray about it. You just need to, we just need to, turn to your neighbor and say, we just need to, we just need to get after it. We really just need to get after what the true witness has said. And then, who is Jesus Christ? He's the light of the world. He's the true witness. Starting in verse 19, he's one with the Father. Verse 19 says, well, they said to him, well, where is your father? (laughs) Jesus answered, you neither, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you'd know my father also. That's pretty straightforward, right? Now, while there was disagreement about who Jesus Christ was at this time, there was no disagreement about who God the Father was. They're like, who your daddy? (laughs) And, And he says, it, you, you don't know me. If you knew who I... Now, it's, just think about it for a minute. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He's eternal God. Is it not fairly self-evident when Jesus says, <laughs> you want to know who my Father is? If you knew who I was, you'd know who my Father is. Ding, right? It's, I mean, that's about as straightforward as it gets. Now, um, I'm not going to be able to explain the Trinity to you at church this week or any week in the future. Um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally existing in three persons, yet one God. How many persons? Three. Come on, how many persons? Three. How many gods? One. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Okay? Now you say, well, I don't get it. Three, one, three, one. I don't get it either. Mystery, mystery, worship. Fall down and worship. God would have had to make our heads bigger than this solar system for us to understand that. That would have messed up other stuff. Okay, so so, um, some stuff you just worship. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which have been revealed belong to us and to our children forever. How many people comfortable with worshiping a God who's got some secrets? Well, but I just don't understand how the Trinity... It's a secret. It's a secret. You good with secrets? I got so weary of seminary, listening to seminary professors say, I figured it out. No, no, you did not. All right? That's just prideful, arrogant. We don't need to know more than what's revealed in the Bible. What's revealed in the Bible is eternal God, three persons, one God. And if you understand even that conceptually... Then when Jesus says, you neither know me nor my father, if you knew me, you'd know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him. I love this. He's so in control, right? I mean, even right now, he's just pushing it. Can you feel him? He's gonna push it a lot more in a second. He's just pushing it, but, but not like we're gonna kill you now, but just we're gonna kill you soon. He's just pushing it because his hour had not yet come, verse 21. So they said to him again, so he said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. That happens every, 
Every, I was just studying this, every 1.7 seconds, um, um, or more than once uh, a second, uh, someone dies. It's like 6,400 people will die uh, during this uh, sermon uh, worldwide. The vast majority of those people are going to die uh, in their sins. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many people are going that way. Narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. Only a few are finding it. And if you've found it, if God has somehow showered such grace upon you in this world that your eyes have been opened to the glorious truth in Jesus, you are of all people most blessed. You will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? <laughs> Everyone go, and all God's people said, come on, all together, make it good, ready? Like, I mean, they are just not getting it, not getting it. I mean, so he's like, I'm leaving, you're not coming, you don't even know who I am. Oh, he's gonna go kill himself. That's what he's trying to say. Where I'm going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. You get it? Nothing makes sense till that makes sense. There, there's something else, there's something more, there's something different, there's a God there's an eternity, there's a heaven, there's a savior. You have a problem, you can't solve it yourself. It's all there. He said to them, you're from below, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he. Who's the he? Now the Father, the Father. Unless you believe that I'm the Father, that's what he's talking about in context. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's my Jehovah's Witness verse. I've told you stories before about my Jehovah's Witness things. And, and uh, look at the greatest Saturday morning of the year is when the Jehovah's Witness is coming to my door, but I don't know, the word, word must be out about me because I'm like dry for like two years now. <laughs> And, and they say, James, I think you should be nicer to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, um, I'm just going to let you study the scriptures a little bit more uh, about the matter of false teachers. And let me just say that uh, if you don't understand what a biblical response is, I'm not going to judge you for one, but you sure shouldn't be judging me for one if you don't know what a biblical response is, okay? Now, the only issue that you would ever want to discuss with someone like that is just this, who's Jesus Christ? There's nothing else to talk about. I don't want to talk about 144,000 people. I don't want to talk about the nation of Israel. I just want to talk about this. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Well, where should we start our discussion? Here's where we're going to start. We're going to start in John 8, 24. All right, because you say that Jesus is one of many sons of God, that, that in the sense that we're all sons of God, you distort John 1, 1 to say that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, in the sense that we'll all be God someday. But I'll just even let that slide for a minute. We're just going to focus in on John 8, 24, because Jesus Christ himself said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. It's the most, look at, look at, Get all the little questions off the table. Take care of the big questions. The little questions will take care of themselves. This is the big question. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? All right. Now, either he is or he isn't who he says he is. He says he is the light of the world, the true witness, he says that he is one with the Father, God of very gods, second person of the Trinity, and he says that if you do not believe this, you will die in your sins. Means unrepentant, unredeemed, unsaved, no heaven, not ever, not for you. You didn't believe the truth about the most important question. Now, you can study religion, you can go to a lot of classes, you can wrestle with a thousand things, but I would encourage you to move all the little questions off the table and get this big question settled 
in your life. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the light of the world. He's the true witness. He's one with the Father. <laughs> so they said to him, and I do appreciate the Pharisees in this instance highlighting uh, the title of my message, verse 25, because that's what the whole passage is about. So they said to him, who, who are you? Good question. Hope you got a good answer. Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have heard from him. God the Father has instilled in me. Now, sometimes in the passage, and this is what's really always interesting in studying Jesus Christ, it's two sides of a coin. Sometimes you see his humanity, and sometimes you see his deity. He's the God-man, Jesus Christ. He set aside, Philippians 2, the prerogatives of deity, the prerogatives of second person, trinity. He set aside the prerogatives of that, brought himself into submission in a unique way to God the Father and became the God-man, Jesus Christ. Sometimes when he says, if you do not believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins, that's a deity statement. But then you see humanity statements like, he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have heard from him. That sounds like Jesus' humanity speaking, right? And it is. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father, that he was one with the Father. They didn't understand that he'd been speaking about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, lift it up, lift it up, it's the cross. It's 100% the cross. He's, he's, not, he's not talking to people. Sometimes Christians will be like, you know, when Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself and we'll sing songs. You know, lift him up, lift him up. Amen. Exalt him. Amen. Yeah. All right. But when it's referenced here, when I'm lifted up, it's not talking about worship. That's talking about crucifixion. When he says essentially here, um, when you've nailed me to the cross, in horror, you will see that I am who I said I was. When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Look at all the relational terms here. He's with me. He's not left me alone. I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. Jesus Christ, one with the Father. Light of the world, true witness, one with the Father. And then this, um, well, before I go to the next part, see verse 30 there, verse 30 through 38. Those of you who are here every week know that we're on a journey that I hope is strengthening and encouraging you through the Gospel of John, called Authentic Jesus, right? We're here every week doing this. and. Uh, now, we've never, in 25 years at our church, we've never preached through the Gospel of John, but shouldn't surprise you that I have preached some messages from the Gospel of John. And interesting, the single message that I've preached in the history of our church that has brought more people to Jesus Christ than any other message I have ever preached is on John chapter 8, verses 30 through 37, okay? And I'm gonna preach that message, God willing. Everyone say God willing. willing. I'm gonna preach that message, God willing, uh, again, uh, next week, next week. So if you have a sister or brother, or a mother or father, or a friend or a neighbor who doesn't know, next week, I'm just telling you, beg, plead, pray, earnestly, uh, a, a bribe, a pay, offer dinner after, do whatever you uh, have to do, uh, pull out all the stops, get them here next week. Just get them here. Just turn to your neighbor and say, get them here. All right? And, and uh, next week, uh, God willing, um, we're going to go through that amazing, amazing story about he who the Son sets free will be free indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I'm just skipping over that for now. God willing, we'll come back to that. And uh, just ju jump down now to verse 38 for this fourth characteristic, who is Jesus Christ. He is a truth seeker. He said, I speak of what I have, have 
seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Uh oh. He's starting to turn it up right there. I speak what I've seen from my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. Now, today we don't go after the dad like that. Today it's more, it's more like your mama, <laughs> right? Um, but um, I, I resisted the temptation to roll out some your mama jokes here. Is that a good decision, ladies? Yes. Thank you. I love you. I do have a little bit of a filter. And, and, and uh, so, um, but if you understand that, then you get, that's what he's going after right here. Because look, when somebody can pull down your family, they, they're pulling you down. And so now it's really gonna come down to who is your daddy? They answered him, Abraham's our father. <laughs> it's, go, it's gonna heat up right here. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd be doing what Abraham did. Your words and your actions don't match. You say you're Abraham's kids, but you don't act like Abraham. You say, you say you love the truth, but I speak the truth. You're, you're, you're trying to kill me. You don't do what Abraham did, verse 40, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You're doing what your father did. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Again, the argument back and forth here is, is that your words cannot be true because if your words were true, your actions would match them. You say you love your wife, but you go to that strip bar every weekend and you come home drunk. You say you love the Word of God, but you never read it, you don't memorize it, you don't meditate on it, you hardly ever think about it. You say you love Christ's church, but all you ever do is criticize it and try to tear it down. Your actions aren't matching what you're saying. And if you understand that kind of an argument, that's what's being made here. You're doing what your father did, verse 41. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. Slam. They don't recognize the virgin birth. They don't recognize the deity of Jesus. Joseph was probably dead by this time, and at least indirectly, but probably directly. Uh, they're challenging. This is like a paternity suit. And they're both going back and forth. So who's your dad? Who's really your dad? Where are you really from? Where's your, who do you belong to? And Jesus is trying to get the truth out. He's a truth seeker. We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God, with no idea that they're talking to him. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you'd love me. Isn't that awesome? It's like, bam! Really? Really? God's your father? Because if uh, God was your father, you'd love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. That's Christ in his humanity speaking. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to hear my word? The weight of truth, right? The weight of, you. The reason you don't like, you don't like what I'm saying. You, you know that famous line? You can't handle the truth. <laughs> and here it comes. This is, this is it. Verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. Want to talk about who your dad is? Your dad's Satan. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus would never say something like that to someone. <laughs> Not my mild-mannered Jesus. Not my sweet Savior. He would never say to someone, you're from Satan. <laughs> well, you should study the Bible more. Jesus has words of love and grace and forgiveness for sinners, for humble people who know they need a Savior 
but he has harsh words of condemnation for the religious people who make people. Jesus said, you make them twice as much a son of hell as yourself. You're, you're dragging other people into hell. Better a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than the way you're offending these innocent people. He's a truth seeker. You're of your father, the devil. We don't talk about Satan that much in church. I did a whole series on it several years ago. Here's just some quick things to jot down. I'm going to put up on the, on the Harvest site this week, a whole message, 10 biblical facts about Satan. If you need to study up on that, I'll just put that on the website. Here's five biblical uh, facts about our enemy. Uh, first of all, he's real. Okay? He's real. He's called by a lot of names uh, in the scriptures. Uh, he's called uh, Beelzebub. He's called uh, here the father of lies. He's called the tempter, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the accuser of the brethren, the serpent, the dragon. He's real. Uh, secondly, he's vicious. 1 Peter 5, 8 says that he walks about like a roaring lion uh, seeking. Uh, the lion was the most feared predator in the ancient world. And Peter said, Satan is like a lion walking about. That's the third thing. He's active. Seeking whom he may devour. All right? Satan is trying to destroy your marriage. Satan is trying to take your children. S Satan is trying to, de to divide Christ's church. Satan is trying to defeat God's people. He is on it, on it, on it, on it. But, ready for some good news? Yeah. Yeah. Though he is a liar, as Jesus informed them here, Satan's a liar. You know the enemy has control of you if you believe things that are not true. He gets to you by lying to you lying through others to you. If you believe lies about God, about the Bible, about others, about yourself, that's the enemy. He's a liar. But the good news is, is that he's defeated. Right, he is a defeated foe. The Bible says that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The Bible says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The Bible says that we are destroying uh, every lofty argument which raises itself against the knowledge of Christ. Scripture says that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And you don't have to put your tail between your legs. You don't have to hang your head if you are a blood-bought son uh, or daughter of the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. All right? We're going to win. And we need to live like winners and stand <laughs> like winners. And here we see our truth seeker just going right to it. You're of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. Some translations say there he's speaking his own language. How do you know Satan's lying? His lips are moving. <laughs> For he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, pretty hard to miss that theme in the passage. True, 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 truth, 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 truly, truly, truth, truly, truly, truth, truth, truly, 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 truly. I circle them all in my circle them all in my Bible just in this passage. There seems to be a theme emerging. I tell you the truth. You do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. He's talking about his own words. If you're from God, if you're with God, you hear God's word as God's word. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. All right, truth seeker, and then this, eternal life. Eternal life, starting in verse 48. The Jews answered him, excuse, back and forth and back and forth. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you're a Samaritan and that you have a demon? Um, now I can see the Lord just kind of softens his tone. Jesus answered, 
I don't have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my, and the reason why, and she's like, the reason why you can't get to me, the reason why you can't touch me, the reason why you can't hold me is because you can't hurt me because I'm not for myself. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. That's that's pretty crazy. If you could just, um, I'm gonna like to read that again. If you could just um, gasp appropriately. Hang on, hang on. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. We just think about that. You're, you're never gonna die. My, my mom didn't die. It looked like that. From this side, we're like, well, she died. But, but it wasn't like that for her. She was like, oh, this is so hard, this is so hard. Ah! <laughs> this is so awesome. And I was telling someone this week, my mom has been in heaven, it'll be three years this summer. And so for her, you know, a day's a thousand years, it seems like three minutes. She's still just like this, <laughs> right? And, and, and it's just so awesome, and you don't die as a follower of Jesus. People will say you died, but you don't. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't die. You don't die. We're gonna get more of that in John chapter 11, so let's keep moving. You just, you just show up in heaven. It's really pretty awesome. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. <laughs> Abraham, so the follower, every, we all thought that part was pretty good, right? But if you don't know the Lord, you're like, oh, that was so demonic. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Short answer, God. (laughs) Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, uh, he is our God. But you have not known him, I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I'd be a liar like you. But I know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced. Well, that's the next part. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So eternal life, jot that down, greater than Abraham. Greater than Abraham. Now what does that mean? Look up here, what does that mean that that he, Abraham, saw my day and he rejoiced? Actually, uh, a parallel term in the Hebrew is that he uh, laughed. And remember, Abraham was more than 100 years old when God gave him faith, he and Sarah, to conceive the child of promise, Isaac. And apparently, and so he laughed and he called his son's name Isaac, which means laughter. And when he saw that little son, apparently he didn't just see him, but that he saw through him, down through the centuries, that a Messiah, the one who would bless and all the promises would be fulfilled through. And so Jesus is saying, well, now that you mention Abraham, he was a quite a fired up about Uh, me getting here. Verse 57, greater than Abraham, and then this last one, almighty God, who is Jesus Christ. So the Jews said to him, you're not 50 years old yet, have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. (gasps) So they picked up stones to throw at him. They're like, that's it, we're killing you. Because you understand when he says, I am, right? That's a reference to Exodus chapter three, where Moses was afraid to do the job that God gave him. He's like, I need a sign, I need a sign. Who should I say sent me? And God said to Moses, he just says, tell him I am sent you. Tell him I am. It means the self-existent one. It's God's name in the Old Testament, Yahweh. We've studied that before. So here Jesus basically is saying, I'm Yahweh. Let's just cut to the chase here. Guys, you're wearing me out. Um, let's let's just, just tell it like it is. Before Abraham was, I am. And they started tearing their clothes and ripping their hair out and picking up rocks. He said, I am almighty God. 
Do you want to know who God is? You're looking at him. Everyone say awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. awesome. Jesus, I've been thinking about this song I learned years ago. Jesus is beyond imagination. Jesus is beyond imagination. His beauty is beyond what I can see. My mind cannot begin to tell how great he is. My vision cannot grasp eternity. I mean, we have dipped our toe today in the depth of the deepest sea of the awesomeness of who Jesus Christ is. Now, um, let's do this. Let's all stand. Answer the big questions, and what? All right, let's, let's just say this together, ready? If you put, I'll put it up on the screen here. Um, go ahead, let's read it together, say it. Take care of the big questions, and the little questions will take care of yourself. All right, lift up your voice, say it again. All right, and that's what we've been trying to do here uh, in this message. So just to review, uh, Jesus Christ is uh, the light of the world. He's the true witness. He is one with the Father. He is a truth seeker, eternal life, greater than Abraham, almighty God. That's who he is. So um, let's just try this uh, message on uh, for size. Uh, you can be the uh, biblical counselors, and I'll be the person uh, who's in need of help. I'm going to... I'll bring up to you a little question that I'm dealing with, and then I want you to give me the big question. The big question is, who is Jesus Christ? Let's say it. Go ahead. It is, who is Jesus Christ? All right. Well, I don't know what to do about my daughter. She's kind of struggling right now. Who is Jesus Christ? My finances are kind of in trouble. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to pay the bills at the end of the month. Who is Jesus Christ? You know, I, I lay awake. I can't get to sleep. I can't stop worrying. I'm battling a temptation. I can't get victory. Come on, I got some bad news from the doctor. I don't know what to do. I'm feeling alone in my marriage. I don't see a way forward. Answer the big question. The little questions will take care of themselves.